everyone! Today we're talking about DNA structure and some DNA processes. So firstly, we'll go into the structure of DNA. And DNA is the genetic material that's found in all cells, and it's found in the nucleus. And so the structure of DNA, you can see here over on the left-hand side, it is a double helix, meaning it is composed of two complementary strands. And so you can see the strands here in blue, um, and there's two of them that are essentially right beside each other, and then they bond with each other, and then they are kind of rotated in a helical shape, which you can also see in picture C over here. And so what the backbone, or what these two strands of DNA are actually made out of, is a group of phosphate and sugar. Uh, and repeating uni units of phosphate sugar. And so if you remember back to macromolecules, we discussed that DNA is based on a nucleotide structure. And so if you look at this yellow uh, structure over here, this, if you recall, is a nucleotide. You have a phosphate group, a sugar, in this case deoxyribose, and a base. And your bases for DNA are over here, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Those are your four nitrogenous bases. Here, this one labeled is called thymine, and it's a single ring structure. Please note that some bases, like adenine over here, are double ring structures, and some bases, like thymine over here, are single ring structures. And a double ring always bonds with a single ring. So from two complementary strands, where we have one base over here and one over here, they bond together. One has to be a double ring, one has to be a single ring. Now, again, going back to that nucleotide, so we're over here with our uh, phosphate sugar base. We put together the phosphate and the sugar into the backbone of the DNA, so the strand itself. And then we put another nucleotide below it phosphate attached to the sugar, which again, that phosphate is attached to its own sugar. So if we were to look down the backbone of DNA, it would be repeating units of phosphate sugar from one base to phosphate sugar of the next, ba uh, of the next nucleotide base to then again phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar going down the backbone. Now the bases that are attached within each nucleotide point to the other strand, the complementary strand. So you have two strands and then the bases point towards each other and they make bonds with each other. Adenine and thymine are those uh, bases that always bond together. They create two bonds with each other. Whereas cytosine and guanine, they create three bonds with each other. And so that is, um, that is always the case for cytosine and guanine and again for adenine and thymine. So you have these two backbones of phosphate sugar bases, and then pointing to each other are the nitrogenous bases. Again, A binds with T, C binds with G. And so again, you can see that picture of the nucleotide. We have three phosphate groups that can be added if you have a larger structure. Um, so you can have up to three nuclei or three phosphate groups there. Again, that's very particular to um, adenosine triphosphate, so ATP. Here we have three groups, cytosine, thymine, and a third group called uracil. Uracil, uh, represented by the letter U, is only found in RNA and not in DNA. So right now we're discussing DNA, uh, but just be aware that U, uracil, is actually found in RNA. And it is found in place of thymines. So there are no thymines in RNA material but it does have uracils instead. So U would bind with A in that circumstance. These are called pyrimidines because they are based on a single ring structure, and these two, A and G, are called purines because they're based on a double ring structure. Now DNA is organized in the nucleus of cells. We have these long strands of DNA wrapped up in a double helix, and they're wrapped up around little proteins called histone proteins. Now, when you coil the histones around the, the DNA, 
and you loop them around each other, that's when you can call the structure chromatin. And then when you condense it and pack it together, um, then it's condensed chromatin. And when you have all that long strand packed together into the shape down here, it's called a chromosome. And this is actually a copied chromosome where the top arm has been copied into the bottom arm. And we'll discuss that more in mitosis and meiosis. So uh, again, we have chromosomes within our cells. We have 46 chromosomes for humans. Um, 25,000 genes, which are uh, pieces of DNA that code for a protein that does something. So we have 25,000 of those interspersed amongst 46 chromosomes. And that's the total number of chromosomes we have as humans. Uh, 23 of them come from your mom and 23 of them come from your dad. So that's what you find in the nucleus of the cells. You find those 46 chromosomes, half from mom, half from dad. Now, 22 pairs of those are called your autosomes. And again, they contain many relevant genes for things like eye color, hair color, height, etc. Um, however, that last pair of chromosomes, uh, they also contain important genes, but many of them are for sex determination. And so if you're female, you have a, a two X chromosomes. Um, so one X from mom and one X from dad. And then if you're male, you have one X uh, from one pair, uh, what, uh, from your mom and you have the Y chromosome from your dad. So if you were to look at a spread of chromosomes within a human, again, you have 23 pairs, 22 of them are called your autosomes, and that last pair is called your sex chromosomes. Now, it's important to discuss the way that DNA copies itself, because how you essentially grow your body is how DNA copies itself. So if you think about your skin cells, you have millions and millions of skin cells, but your skin constantly regenerates. So we need to make new cells from the pre-existing cells. So when we have a cell and when we copy it and divide it in half so that one copy goes in each direction, that's called mitosis. And what has to happen within the nucleus and with the DNA is called DNA replication. So replication happens within mitosis. That's how we copy the DNA. So here I drew a picture for you as to how DNA replication occurs. So you have a double-stranded DNA molecule. You have your A, C, T's, and G's on the top strand, and they are complementary binded to the bottom strand. So if you were to have an A at the top, it would be bound to a T on the bottom strand. So if you know your top strand, you automatically know what the complementary bottom strand would be. In any case, the first step of replication is for the DNA to open up. So essentially there are enzymes involved in order to make this process work that essentially just open up those two DNA strands. So I drew those strands opening up in one direction, but really your DNA is very long, and so DNA will open at several places. Um, throughout that long strand. And you need a really special enzyme. Here I've abbreviated it as DNAP, which stands for DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase is the most important enzyme for DNA replication because it's going to add the, uh, the nucleotides that you need in order to make this double strand essentially four strands. So you open up those two original strands here, and where I drew the dotted line is essentially where the DNA polymerase would be adding new nucleotides. And DNA polymerase is very fast. For one second, it adds 50 nucleotides. So it goes um, and looks around in the cell, tries to find the corresponding nucleotide, and it adds it very quickly. So if on the original strand I had A, C, T, DNA polymerase would come in and bring the complementary uh, sequence. So I would be putting in T, G, and A. So DNA polymerase would be extending that and creating a brand new strand right underneath this top one. 
it would do the same thing on this bottom strand. It would add the appropriate nucleotide bases. Once DNA polymerase has done that for the whole sequence of DNA, then uh, termination occurs. And termination is when those two strands are finally completely separated from each other. So again, more enzymes are involved in this process. Uh, the most important one being DNA polymerase in elongation. But there are other enzymes involved in termination, and that's when those two DNA strands finally separate. So when these two DNA strands separate fully, you get two brand new daughter DNA molecules, um, each of them with a copy of the old strand, and each of them with a copy of the newly synthesized strand by DNA polymerase. And so this process is called semi-conservative because each of these daughter DNAs has a copy of the old strand and a copy of the brand new strand. So this is the way by which uh, DNA copies itself in order to pass on identical DNA to new growing cells. Uh, sometimes errors can occur and errors that accumulate are known as cancers. And so problems in this process of DNA replication can potentially lead to a mass of cells that are abnormal if the DNA is not copied properly. So DNA po uh, polymerase must work accurately in order for this process to occur perfectly. Sometimes DNA polymerase makes errors, and again, if they accumulate, that could be devastating in the body. But DNA polymerase actually reads itself, uh, so it proofreads itself. It can go back and double check, cut out pieces that were wrongly placed, and then repair them. So that's a type of repair pathway in the body. Now, this process of DNA replication uh, that we just discussed is different for the process than the process of something called gene expression. Now, as I mentioned to you, we have 25,000 approximate uh, numbers of genes within our nucleus uh, dispersed amongst 46 chromosomes, and we need to express or um, transform these genes into working pieces in the cell. And so working pieces in the cell uh, essentially means proteins. So genes are the building blocks that make proteins in the cell. And proteins in the cell, the 25,000 and more that are made in the cell, um, they are used for different things. And essentially, all of your proteins have a function. All of your proteins put together make up you. So there are proteins, again, for your eye color, hair color, uh, height, etc. All of these proteins together, they code for every single part of you. And they are originally coded for by our DNA. So for every gene we have, we have the corresponding protein that's made in the cell. So this isn't about taking a cell and copying it and making sure the DNA is copied. That was replication. This gene expression process is, of, is about taking the DNA and making a meaningful protein from it that actually acts in the cell. Because the DNA itself doesn't do anything in the cell, it's just held in the nucleus. It's the blueprint for which proteins are built and they actually do things in the cell. like. Um, they can be involved in any process, like storing things, transporting things. There's proteins that are coded, uh, that encode signaling factors in the body and hormones, etc. So it's really used for everything in the cell. So this is the short process of gene expression. DNA is first made into a structure called RNA. And the RNA is that intermediary structure that then gets made into a protein. So why do we have this RNA in between? Why can't we just make a protein from DNA? Because proteins are made on ribosomes in the cytoplasm and DNA is too big to leave the nucleus. So it creates a copy of itself called RNA. It's a single strand copy. And that copy is then made into the protein because the RNA copy can leave the nucleus. It's really small compared to the DNA. And so it acts as that intermediary message and hence, this type of RNA is called messenger RNA, or mRNA. 
And there are various types of RNA in the body if you look in the literature, but mRNA is the specific one involved in this process. The picture on the right shows just a, a snapshot of what's happening here. So here in blue, you have the double-stranded DNA. The double-stranded DNA opens up and you make an RNA copy here in pink. Um, the RNA copy gets processed before it leaves the nucleus. This is what this is showing. Basically, any part of that little RNA strand that, aren't go that isn't going to be used to build the protein, it can get cut out because every gene has pieces inside of it that aren't actually useful for making the protein. They're just um, kind of what's known as junk. Uh, they're not useful for building the protein, so they can get taken out. Those little pieces of non-coding regions are called introns, and they can get taken out of that RNA strand, and then um, only the coding uh, protein pieces are left. Uh, then the RNA will leave the nucleus and it'll go find a ribosome which is floating around in the cytoplasm and the primary purpose of ribosomes is protein synthesis and so the then a process known as translation will occur right on a ribosome where a protein is made. So let's discuss these two arrows. The first arrow is called transcription. That's where we make RNA from DNA. And the second arrow is called translation. That's where we make protein from RNA. So here's transcription. It should look really similar to DNA replication because it's uh, very much like that process with a few key differences. Here's the double-stranded DNA at the top. Again, in initiation, the DNA opens up, which you've already seen before. Again, you need lots of pro en enzymes to make this process work. And for elongation or for adding nucleotides, instead of DNA polymerase, it's called the enzyme is called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase because you're making RNA. So this enzyme gets added to the mix, and it will go in and find the appropriate nucleotides and add them only to one strand of the DNA. So in this case, I'm showing you the bottom strand, but it really could be either one. And don't forget, as you're building this RNA, you have to remember that you cannot include T's or thymine in them. You have to include uracils or U in place of thymine. So if I had a C T on this DNA strand down here, my appropriate basis to add would be U G A. And so you always have to remember wherever you would have put a T, you should put a uracil instead. RNA is built upon A, C, G's, and U's. Then termination occurs, and that's again um, where we have two products released, but instead of the, this DNA being pulled apart, what happens is the DNA closes back up. It has to remain unchanged. So it's not being copied. It's just in the sense that we need it split into two cells. It's being copied only on one strand in order to provide a messenger transcript. And so what happens, there's a signal via enzymes that releases this RNA strand that's made, this little dotted line. The RNA strand kind of floats away and the DNA closes back up. And so in this case, this mRNA strand, remember this is a messenger RNA, then can leave the nucleus, uh, travel to the cytoplasm where the protein is made. Now again, this is a copy of the DNA. But remember, there's something we can do before it leaves the nucleus. We can take out those introns or regions that we don't need to make a protein. So this mRNA actually gets a lot shorter. And we add things on the left hand side or uh, the left hand side of it and the right hand side for protection. And that's called a cap and a tail. And it will help the mRNA be protected in the cytoplasm, which is a dangerous environment for the mRNA. It can degrade it if it doesn't have protection. Now something to note before I discuss the next step, which is translation, is the way the genetic code works. And essentially every three letters, so every triplet of the RNA, 
codes for a particular amino acid. And this is something you would not need to memorize. You would be given this or you can refer to this uh, when tested. But for every triplet that you could make using the letters A, C, G, and U, uh, so you have 64 possibilities, each of those codes for a protein, or I should say most of those codes for, a, uh, sorry, not a protein, an amino acid. And so you can see, for example, the letters, if you have U, U, U in a triplet, that codes for phenylalanine. That's one of the amino acid. Or if you have U, U, A, it codes for leucine and so forth. Now, a really important one is AUG. AUG is the start of every protein. It codes for methionine, but it also signals the start of translation. Just as we have a start, we also have a stop. So UAA, UAG, and UGA are your three stop codons. They don't code for amino acids. Instead, instead they signal the stop of translation. Now you know that we have approximately 20 amino acids that build up the human body. So much of these letters and much of these codons will be redundant. So CCU codes for the same thing as CCC, proline. Um, that's because this genetic code is redundant. We do have several different triplets that code for the same thing, just because we only have 20 amino acids, whereas we could make 64 triplets. And this genetic code is universal, meaning that uh, UCU spells out the same amino acid in us as humans versus mice or fruit flies. So that's what is meant by universal. So this is how uh, translation occurs. Again, it happens on a ribosome. So if you take a look at this picture on the right, uh, here on the bottom is part of the ribosome in this light orange color. And here, this darker orange color is a sequence of RNA, uh, mRNA. And it starts with AUG. So AUG is our start codon meaning this is where we have um, the start of translation. Something important to note is that another type of RNA called a transfer or a tRNA is used in this process. It's basically like an enzyme, except it's not an enzyme, but it works like the enzyme for this process. So specifically the structure of a tRNA involves an amino acid attachment site. So at the top of this little green tRNA is where an amino acid will atta attach and something called an anticodon on the bottom part. An anticodon is just the complementary sequence of the codon. So here we have AUG. What is the complementary sequence of that? It's UAC. So UAC is the anticodon found on this tRNA. And so for every triplet, you're going to have a different tRNA coming in that has the appropriate anticodon. Now, again, this uh, tRNA structure, it brings in amino acids. And what does AUG code for? If you go back, it codes for methionine. And so methionine is the amino acid that's brought in on this tRNA structure. So essentially what's going to happen is, again, the process of initiation, elongation, and termination. Lots of enzymes are used, and even energy is used in this process. So the first initiator tRNA will bind to the AUG region of the mRNA, and it'll bring in the first amino acid, which is known as initiation. This happens in a region of the ribosome called the P-site. And that's not written up here, but if you go down to the third image, you can see the full ribosome here as that light orange color. And here in blue, you can see this labeled P. So really where this, uh, where this binding occurs on the ribosome is kind of in the middle of the ribosome, which is called the P-site. Over on the left of the ribosome, you call that the E-site. And over on the right is called the A-site. So it goes EPA. And so um, the first binding is in that P site. So sites that are now open are the A site on the right and the E site on the left. And so how this process occurs next is through elongation. Your A site is open. That's where you're going to get the next tRNA binding. The E site isn't used for anything really except exiting the ribosome. So that's not important just yet. 
So if the A site is open, the next tRNA with the proper anticodon for the next codon will come in. So the next codon is UUC, and the complementary bases are AAG. So this codon will come in, or sorry, this tRNA will come in and bind to that codon. Now, what does UUC stand for? UUC stands for phenylalanine. So that is the next amino acid that's brought in. When these two tRNAs are actually bound in the ribosome in the E and the, uh, sorry, in the P and the A site, respectively, uh, what happens is that the amino acid that's attached to the P site tRNA will form a bond with the amino acid that's attached to the A site tRNA. And when they form a bond together, what will happen is the methionine that's on the P site tRNA will actually hop over to the phenylalanine amino acid that's on the A site tRNA. So we're going to get this guy over here hopping over to this guy over here. That's important because essentially what happens in translation elongation is this ribosome moves down on the mRNA strand. And when it's moving down, that means anything that was in the A site will now be in the P site. Anything that was in the P site will now be in the E or exit site and it leaves the ribosome. Well, we don't want this tRNA in green to exit the ribosome before it gives away its methionine. So as we get the ribosome moving, this methionine has to quickly hop over to the phenylalanine, and this tRNA will then be able to leave the ribosome. So as we get that shift, this AAG anticodon that's in this tRNA we're going to see it now in the P site. It's moved over by one spot. We see it in the P site. Uh, the original first P site tRNA can now exit. We know that on this new P site tRNA, we have phenylalanine and methionine attached, and the A site was open to let the next tRNA come in. So the next sequence is CGA, and the anticodon is GCU, and CGA, the codon, if we look, CGA, CGA codes for arginine, and so that is the next amino acid that's brought in. Then the same thing would happen. Anything on the pTRNA is going to have to hop over to anything that's on the A site tRNA. So phenylalanine and methionine will both hop over to arginine and then everything will shift over by one spot again. This just continues until you encounter a stop codon on the mRNA. So like UAG. If we found UAG to be the next codon, then the whole process would stop. And the sequence that would be on here, which would be arginine, phenylalanine, methionine, would be released, and that would be your protein. It would then be altered in the endoplasmic reticulum, moved to the Golgi, and then shipped to wherever it needs to go in the cell to, in order to do its job. So this is the process of translation. And I wrote out some steps on the next slide so you can review this process. What I also wanted to show you is this video uh, that you can have a look at in YouTube. I typed in transcription and translation, and this one is called DNA transcription and translation. So it gives you the picture of what's happening all together. In order for our bodies to function, we need to supply them with a variety of nutrients we get from our diet. Our bodies cannot use the food as it is when it enters our digestive system. The process of chemical digestion uses different proteins and enzymes to break down the food particles into usable nutrients our cells can absorb. And where are the instructions to manufacture these and all the different types of proteins we need to stay alive? The instructions to make proteins are contained in our DNA. DNA contains genes. A gene is a continuous string of nucleotides containing a region that codes for an RNA molecule. This region begins with a promoter and ends in a terminator. Genes also contain regulatory sequences that can be found near the promoter or at a more distant location. 
For some genes, the encoded RNA is used to synthesize a protein in a process called gene expression. For these genes, expression can be divided into two processes, transcription and translation. In eukaryotic cells, transcription occurs in the nucleus, where DNA is used as a template to make messenger RNA. Then in translation, which occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, the information contained in the messenger RNA is used to make a polypeptide. During transcription, the DNA in the gene is used as a template to make a messenger RNA strand with the help of the enzyme RNA polymerase. This process occurs in three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. During initiation, the promoter region of the gene functions as a recognition site for RNA polymerase to bind. This is where the majority of gene expression is controlled, by either permitting or blocking access to this site by the RNA polymerase. Binding causes the DNA double helix to unwind and open. Then during elongation, the RNA polymerase slides along the template DNA strand. As the complementary bases pair up, the RNA polymerase links nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing RNA molecule. Once the RNA polymerase reaches the terminator portion of the gene, the messenger RNA transcript is complete and the RNA polymerase, the DNA strand, and the messenger RNA transcript dissociate from each other. The strand of messenger RNA that is made during transcription includes regions called exons that code for a protein and non-coding sections called introns. In order for the messenger RNA to be used in translation, the non-coding introns need to be removed and modifications such as a 5' prime cap and a 3' prime poly A tail are added. This process is called intron splicing and is performed by a complex made up of proteins and RNA called a spliceosome. This complex removes the intron segments and joins the adjacent exons to produce a mature messenger RNA strand that can leave the nucleus through a nuclear pore and enter the cytoplasm to begin translation. How is the information in the mature messenger RNA strand translated into a protein? The nitrogenous bases are grouped into three letter codes called codons. The genetic code includes 64 codons. Most codons code for specific amino acids. There are four special codons one that codes for start and three that code for stop. Translation begins with the messenger RNA strand binding to the small ribosomal subunit upstream of the start codon. Each amino acid is brought to the ribosome by a specific transfer RNA molecule. The type of amino acid is determined by the anticodon sequence of the transfer RNA. Complementary base by the codon sequence and not the anticodon sequence. So for instance, here we have AUG as the codon sequence um, and AUG codes for methionine. So the amino acid showing here, the purple one is methionine. Um, methionine is not coded for by UAC, which is the anticodon on the tRNA. So that's something uh, that's incorrect in the video. So make sure you're aware it's the codon that codes for the amino acid. It's not the anticodon. The anticodon is just used to bind to the codon on the mRNA strand. Pairing occurs between the codon of the messenger RNA and the anticodon of the transfer RNA. After the initiator transfer RNA molecule binds to the start codon, the large ribosomal subunit binds to form the translation complex and initiation is complete. In the large ribosomal subunit, there are three distinct regions called the E, P, and A sites. 
During elongation, individual amino acids are brought to the messenger RNA strand by a transfer RNA molecule through complementary base pairing of the codons and anticodons. Each anticodon of a transfer RNA molecule corresponds to a particular amino acid. A charged transfer RNA molecule binds to the A site and a peptide bond forms between its amino acid and the one attached to the transfer RNA molecule at the P site. The complex slides down one codon to the right where the now uncharged transfer RNA molecule exits from the E site and the A site is open to accept the next transfer RNA molecule. Elongation will continue until a stop codon is reached. A release factor binds to the A site at a stop codon, and the polypeptide is released from the transfer RNA in the P site. The entire complex dissociates and can reassemble to begin the process again at initiation. The purpose of translation is to produce polypeptides quickly and accurately. After dissociation, the polypeptide may need to be modified before it is ready to function. Modifications take place in different organelles for different proteins. In order for a digestive enzyme to be secreted into the stomach or intestines, the polypeptide is translated into the endoplasmic reticulum, modified as it passes through the Golgi, then secreted using a vesicle through the plasma membrane of the cell into the lumen of the digestive tract. So again, proteins are needed for all processes within the body, and those proteins can either stay in the cell and work there, or they can be released, as is shown here, and uh, they can go to any place in the body where they are needed. Now, it's important to note that mutations can occur in this process. And that's how errors in, occur in the process of gene expression. That's how incorrect proteins can be made, which can lead to disease. And so it's important to note that mutations can always happen. Now, where you have a, a, a mutation that has no effect on the resulting protein, it's called a silent mutation. And that's a type of nucleotide substitution. So if you had a sequence like AAG, and you mutated one of those letters, but it didn't code for a different amino acid than it would have. And then in that case, you would have a silent mutation. A missense mutation is a type of substitution of one of those bases where it now does code for a different amino acid. And a nonsense substitution is where you, again, substitute one of those bases, and it turns that amino acid into a stop codon. And then the rest of the protein can't get made. So when you have an early introduction of this stop codon, that's a nonsense mutation. Insertions and deletions uh, can also occur, and those are pretty severe mutations. So if you have a strand of DNA, or I should say RNA, for example, um, if you cut out a couple letters or you delete five letters within that sequence, that's called a deletion. And then what's um, following that deletion would shift over, and now we would get triplets that are brand new in a totally new and random way. And so those would code for brand new amino acids that weren't part of that original protein. And this is a type of frame shift mutation because it changes the reading frame of the codons. And that can happen via an insertion as well. So sometimes you have a long sequence, and if you insert two bases somewhere that shifts everything downstream into a different reading frame. And so you get brand new amino acids being added in this protein that weren't supposed to be there. And so if you look at these mutations altogether, the nonsense, the insertions and the deletions are fairly um, severe. This sense, I mean, if you have one amino acid that's changed to a different amino acid, it could have a severe effect, like in the example of sickle cell disease, but it might not have much of an effect if it's just one amino acid change out of a string of uh, 50 amino acids. It might still function somewhat normally. And so that's 
it depends on what that amino acid is. So it's not, it, it's not as severe as the other uh, three I mentioned. Silent is the best mutation because it doesn't change amino acid structure, as I mentioned. So here we have pictures of these various mutations um, in the form of DNA. And you can see, again, the definitions of each of these mutations, and it shows you a base sequence change. So here, this valine, uh, GTA codes for valine. Well, if we change that last A to a T, the valine that's coded, um, it's, it's the same amino acid. GTT uh, would be uh, coding for valine as well. Now remember, this is showing the DNA sequence, not the RNA sequence, so it can be somewhat confusing. Remember, the RNA sequence would be different. It would have uracils in it, and it would be the complementary base sequence to these. So you have to do a little bit of um, figuring out what would be your RNA sequence and then seeing that, again, valine and valine would be the resulting amino acids. Same thing for the rest of these, but again, it's just showing you what's happening. Here we have CCC, uh, which again, the RNA sequence of that would have coded for proline. And here we have ACC, which changes the RNA sequence and hence would, we would have a different amino acid, threonine in this case. Nonsense is where we get an early stop codon. So for example, here TAC, if we had a whole bunch of more codons after that, then um, if we accidentally turn TAC into a stop codon, TAG, then um, we would not have any more protein being made. And again, frame shift ends up changing, whether it's an insertion or deletion, it ends up changing every amino acid following the change. So if we, um, for example, if we have valine here, but now we've inserted new, um, if we've inserted, or in this case, deleted the T and the A here, these three Cs would need to shift over to the left. And actually, only two of them would take the place. So this would be G, C, C, and then the next C would be up here. And then we'd have to borrow the T and the A from there, fill that in, and so on. So the last thing I wanted to mention from this unit is controlling gene expression. So we all have the same 25,000 genes, and we all may or may not have a few mutations from each other, but that's not really what makes us different because we all have essentially the same set of genes. And so what makes us different is how those genes are regulated or controlled. This means turning them on and turning them off. So some of us might turn on 10,000 of those genes, and some of us might turn on only 5,000 of those genes. So what is controlling in the cell what's turning these genes on and off? So what I wanted to draw your attention to is that, first of all, prokaryotes are a little bit different than eukaryotes. On the left-hand side, the process of gene expression is very simplistic. It all happens at the same time, transcription and translation. But in humans here on the right-hand side and more complex animals, it happens in two separate regions of the cell, and it happens one after the other. So we are much more complex. We can actually control gene expression at every level of gene expression. So we have DNA being made into RNA, being made into protein, the two processes called transcription and translation. So we can actually control whether a protein is made at the DNA level, at the transcription level, at the RNA level, at the translation level, and at the protein level. So we can control whether that final product, the protein, is made at any number of those levels. So if you think about at the DNA level, there's a process called X chromosome inactivation, or DNA packaging. So if we actually squish the DNA really, really, really tightly, we can't get enzymes in there to perform gene expression. So we control that right at the DNA level, right at the top level. We shut off pro uh, proteins from being made because they can't, nothing can even get in there to make those proteins. So uh, that can happen in females. One of our X chromosomes, because we have two, it can be silenced. So in that case, the X chromosome gets really, really squished together. So no machinery can come in and transcribe and translate those genes. And so they don't need to be expressed. Now, at the, uh, at the transcription level, 
that's where we look at things like enhancers and activators, as well as repressors and silencers. And these are just names for different enzymes and factors that can come in during the process of transcription and either help speed it up, slow it down, turn it off or turn it on. So there are actual factors named after what they do to either help enhance transcription or uh, decrease transcription. So maybe in one of my cells, um, this one gene is being made very quickly because it's sped up because of an enhancer that makes it go faster. And so maybe that makes my uh, product that's made different than your product, for example. Uh, now at the RNA level, there are little pieces of RNAs in our cells called microRNAs. And these are very different than mRNAs. They're like Pac-Man. When they sense an mRNA transcript in the cytoplasm, they'll come over and they'll actually eat it up. And so that turns off the process of gene expression because then you don't have that copy in order to make the protein. Now at the translation and protein level, we know that proteins need to get folded in the endoplasmic reticulum in order to properly work. So sometimes we can turn gene expression off by misfolding the protein. And if we misfold the protein or don't properly activate it, then it won't even be made, it, it won't be able to work in the body. And so you can turn off gene expression in that way. So epigenetics is actually the term for gene regulation. It's changes that happen on top of the DNA that are actually heritable. And so there's been a lot of studies in the literature looking at epigenetic causes of disease. And so what we know now is that it's not so much important what genes we inherit from our parents, but what are the regulatory mechanisms of those genes? Because that's actually what makes us different, what makes those uh, genes change. And things like what we experience in utero and during childhood, development-wise, that changes the pattern of our genes. It doesn't mutate a particular base, like an A to a T. It just changes the way the DNA might be packaged such that genes might not be able to be expressed uh, appropriately. And so one great example of this is studies by Michael Meany and colleagues at McGill University in Canada. And so uh, this researcher looks at epigenetic control of certain glutamate receptor genes. And glutamate receptors have to do with glutamate signaling in the brain. And this has been linked with anxiety. And what he studies, he studies rats. And he groups mother rats into two categories, those that are high licking and grooming or high parental care, and those that are low licking and grooming or low parental care. And then he looks at not what genes are mutated, but how they are expressed differently. So maybe one's turned on a lot more or one's turned off a lot more in the high licking grooming versus the low licking grooming. So um, he groups those mothers into those two categories and then looks at the pups or the offspring. And he notices that when those uh, pups are adults, the ones that were born to low licking mothers have higher anxiety levels and the ones born to high licking and grooming mothers um, have uh, no anxiety. And so uh, the, the researcher was interested as to why and it's because it's not that the glutamate receptor gene is mutated. He didn't find any mutation in the gene itself, in the DNA or the RNA. What he found was he looked at this glutamate receptor gene and it just so happens that in the low licking and grooming mothers, what happened to their offspring is this gene was packaged really tightly. So it's there, it just wasn't able to be transcribed and translated well enough. And this gene is supposed to help with anxiety if it's actually activated. Uh, in the higher looking and grooming mothers, uh, this gene was activated. And he found that because this gene was activated, the pups were able to deal with um, difficult circumstances uh, like predators in their environment and were not anxious. 
And so what our mothers do during pregnancy and early life actually blueprints our DNA, turns certain genes on and off to um, based on their environment. Environmental chemicals are also categorized here. Drugs and pharmaceuticals. Uh, there's the saying that you are what your grandmother ate. So there's studies done on grandmothers from Europe who endured times of famine. The signals in the environment while those grandmothers were pregnant with their children were that there's not a lot of food around. And so those signals got translated into the DNA and turned off certain genes within the brain of the developing child. And so when you look at the grandchildren of grandmothers who endured times of famine, the grandchildren have over a 30% increase in rates of obesity. And it's not because their genes are mutated. It's because certain genes were turned off or on um, that are different uh, because of the cues from the environment that the grandmothers were in. And the cues were, you better make sure that you get all the nutrients from your food because there's not a lot of food around. And so that translated over generations to the grandchildren even. And the grandchildren now have this chemical signature on their DNA that tells them you must extract all the nutrients from the food you eat. Um, because there's not a lot of food around, even though that's not the case for the environment now. Um, so these interesting nuances in the environment actually pass down transgenerationally based on these epigenetic signatures. So aging and diet are part of those. Same thing with stress. Pregnant mothers who endured high stress environments actually passed on those phenotypes to their children. And again, these are not mutations in the DNA. They happen on the DNA. They package the DNA differently such that your genes are still there. They're still not mutated, but they just are regulated in a different way. And anything in an, our environment can regulate our genes in a different way. So if we don't have mutations passed on from our parents for a disease, um, then we're less likely to get that disease. But now if we put ourselves in an environment uh, that increases our chance for the disease, that can actually shape and change our genes that gives an increased chance for our own children and grandchildren to develop a disease. So it's really interesting how epigenetic plays a, uh, epigenetics plays a role in gene expression. And over here on the right-hand side of this picture, you can see that there's been many, many different illnesses linked to epigenetic causes. Cancer, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, mental disorders like schizophrenia, diabetes, and other cardiovascular illnesses, all of those have epigenetic causes. So again, it's not that you inherited a mutated gene from your parents that gives you an increased likelihood of diabetes, for example. It's the environment that played a role in shaping those, the way those genes are regulated, and that got passed down. So I wanted to end that today. We talked about uh, the structure of DNA. We talked about the process of DNA uh, replication, which is the way DNA copies itself to sustain our bodies. And then we delved into gene expression, the way that different proteins are made in our bodies from our genetic blueprint. And those two processes were transcription and translation. And then afterwards, um, I told you that sometimes we can get mutations um, in that process, but more so diseases nowadays, we know are caused not by specific mutations like those that I identified, but more so by environmental epigenetic effects that can get passed on through families. So if you have any questions about the lecture, please let me know. Thank you.